Hello and welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles, both as a group and solo artists, past, present, future, and also people who uh, worked with them and dealt with them and uh, were in their world. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop and Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything. And I'm joined by my three regular co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know is the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing. Hello, Ken. Hey, Alan. Hi, everybody. And Steve Marinucci, the world's only full-time Beatles reporter, whose work you can read in Billboard.com and Axis.com, that's A-X-S, and also the author of Meet a Monkey, Davy Jones. Hey, Steve. Hey, Alan. Hello, everyone. And last but not least, Al Sussman, the executive editor of Beetle Fan Magazine and the author of the book Changing Times, 101 Days That Shaped a Generation, which the Beatles figure into naturally. Hi, Al. Hi, Alan. Hello there, everybody. Okay. So... Obviously, this week, the big news is the death of Chuck Berry, who was a monumental figure in the Beatles world and our world and the rock world in general. And we're going to spend a lot of the show talking about Chuck and his influence. And uh, but, but first, we want to sort of do a few shorter news items Beginning with, I guess, I mean, we'll take them chronologically. There was a report last week about Jerry Marsden falling in a concert, and we've heard sort of reports about his health problems in recent years. But it turns out Steve, I think, can tell us what really went on. Well, the initial reports of of Jerry Marsden um, said he had collapsed on the stage and there were implications in the early reports that it had to do with his uh, health problems. Uh, He had been scheduled, for example, to lead a tour of a British invasion tour several years ago and the tour was canceled at the last minute because of his health problems. Well, this wasn't because of that. uh, Let me just correct you on one thing there. Go ahead. The tour – the tour went ahead. Jerry wasn't a part of it because oh, okay. he was at the, at the last right. minute. His, that's, his doctor, that's right. that's right. his doctors advised him not to uh, not to travel, basically by air. Well, well, that wasn't the case. I mean, it wasn't a heart thing or anything mm-hmm. like that. This time, what happened? What he told the Liverpool Echo on the seventeenth was that uh, his knee started acting up, and it was the knee that caused him to leave the stage. And he said it, his final quote to the final sentence to the echo was it was nothing serious and it sure doesn't sound like it. He said he lost his balance and his PA came up, got his guitar and they uh, took him off stage. So he said it's it's not serious and it just more a pain in the knee more than anything else. Mm. So mm. that's that's good news because there was a lot of concern that Jerry was seriously ill. Uh, but that's not the case. Yeah, there so, was in fact there was in fact there was there was one person that I saw in particular on Facebook who basically assumed that he was dead, and <laughs> uh, you know because it would, you know, I, I have a feeling he just didn't read the uh, the post because you know the Daily Mail you know dispatch was was so dramatic you know e- mm-hmm. it easily you know it easily could have uh led somebody to believe that uh, that you know that Jerry had died but uh but as you as you as you said you know obviously it's not that not hopefully not that serious right i mean there's always the you know there's always the the possibility that with these things you, i mean you never know but apparently in this case you know he's okay, so that's mm-hmm. okay. that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Let's just wish him well. We yeah. wish him well. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Okay, and then um, moving forward, a week ago today, we re- we taped this on Monday. A week ago tonight, uh, Tommy Lapuma died. Um, major American producer of mostly jazz discs, but not just. Mm-hmm. I mean, he produced Dave Mason. Um, Michael Franks, um, Dr. John, 
Uh, but also, you know, he's, he's, he's best known for his work with people like George Benson, Al Jarreau. Uh, Diana Krall. Diana, Diana Krall, Krall of course, go. right. And, uh, Barbara yeah, Streisand. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But from our point of view, of course, you know, the connection is uh, with Paul McCartney, Kisses on the Bottom. Um, and, you know, Paul at the time spoke very warmly about him and working with him. And, uh, you know, and I think... You know, bringing him to get him together, Paul and uh, Diana Krall, uh, I think was a was a great idea. I'm not sure if it was Tony Lupuma's idea, but I mean, obviously, there's a connection through Tony Lupuma, Tommy Lupuma, uh, between them. Uh, so, uh, any of you have any um, and a connection uh, between Diana Krall and Paul, right? Mm-hmm. And Elvis, you know, mm-hmm. and yeah, exactly, right. Okay. Well, Kisses on the Bottom was was an impeccably produced album. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean it was masterfully produced. The arrangements of all the songs, everything was balanced so well. Mm-hmm. You know, and you've got top notch musicians all throughout on every single song. And uh, I would like to say for anyone that never saw it at all, but there is a video of Paul and Tommy mm-hmm. Lapuma together being interviewed about the making of the album, and you can see uh, Tommy was saying that Paul. He always felt that Paul had a a very good understanding of standards and how well-crafted the songs were just by judging the music that that Paul has done through the years. And, um, you know, it's a really good interview that you can find online. You can go onto YouTube and just bring up Paul McCartney and Tommy LaPuma, and it's a really good interview. Mm -hmm. Yep. I mean, for for people who... who um, dislike Paul's vocal sound on that album, which we've we've talked about. Uh, mm-hmm. You know the the arrangements and the you know Tom, Tommy Lapuma's work on the record is is in in a lot of ways its selling point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very oh, much yeah. so. Ab- absolutely. I, yeah. yeah, if there's any reason to criticize the album, you know, from my point of view, it's it's Paul's vocals. But no, the arrangements were fantastic and. Um, I was lucky enough when I was in Capitol last year to walk in that room where they did that, and it was like, and I could almost see everybody sitting there, you know, doing the, you know, doing it over again, and uh, it was it was very cool to be in that same room. Um, yeah, yeah. In fact, the uh, the 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 video version of uh, of the album called uh, you know Live Kisses mm-hmm. is is almost almost better than the album itself it's mm-hmm. it's that good and uh and you can see uh you know because uh, basically paul did that session in much the same way that frank sinatra used to do uh mm-hmm. his sessions at capitol with uh you know just sitting you know sitting at a you know at a podium with the lyrics in front of him and the you know the music sheets in front of him and the orchestra playing all around him and that was pretty much the case here with uh, with live kisses. Right. I don't know if I don't know if iTunes still has it but you mm. could get the audio of the album and the live session that they did for iTunes together. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, don't know. I, I and that was and, and I I I think it's I would assume it's still there. Mm. But if for anybody who really wants, you know, the complete experience of that album, that's what to look for. Um yeah, I think it's I think it's maybe called Complete Kisses, something mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, I think that's the title. Well, yeah. I've gotten very used to that album and Paul's vocals on it, and I think his vocals blend very well with that arrangement. Do you really? So I don't I don't really understand why. I mean, I love watching live Kisses. It's the same vocals. It's the same mm-hmm. delivery. It's just you're mm-hmm. watching him do it, mm-hmm. so you're more involved with the actual performance. I think I think that that's part of it. Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. that's part. I think that is part of it because it, yeah, it is easier to watch for me to watch live kisses. Although I, I have to admit, I haven't watched it for a while. I should take it out and watch it. Watch it again. But I think you're right. I think that's absolutely true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can see you can see the expressions on Paul's face as he's trying to to you know give his own approach to each song. And when he was moved with um, more than I can wish you, mm-hmm. uh, that song. Mm. You know when he talks about that. You know, it's very touching. Yeah. So you you feel very more connected with Paul with mm-hmm. those recordings when it's been live and you're visually seeing him. And and I love uh, 
I'm a big, big fan of Diana Krall. And she, of course, he returned the favor by donating a song to her last album. So That's right. Um, that was produced by Tommy Lapuma. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, off of Wildflower. The, oh, the one, the one that Paul wrote? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's I yeah. Wonder If I Take You Home tonight. Yes, that's, like that. it. Oh, yeah. that's it. That's mm-hmm. okay. yeah. yeah. it. Good Thanks. song. Yeah. Yes, mm-hmm. it is. Well, that whole album is great. But, uh, yeah, so... Yeah, it was, uh, you know, obviously, uh, you know, not having Nelson Riddle around anymore, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, that uh, obviously he kind of set the standard for those kinds of albums, uh, you know, not only with, of course, Sinatra's classic albums in the, uh, you know, in the 50s and 60s, but also with uh, his work with uh, Linda Ronstadt in the 80s oh, yeah. uh, right. shortly before before his death <laughs> but uh, but uh, but Tommy Lapuma was kind of like almost like an inheritor of that uh, of that tradition mm. good point mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. okay okay and we have uh, one more item, which uh, is uh, Steve has been looking at the billboard charts and found found a few interesting little tidbits for us. Steve? Yeah, um, this, the current issue of Billboard uh, with um, three the three amigos on the cover has uh, the the Beatles in a couple of spots. The Billboard 200, uh, the one album is 159. Abbey Road is 169. But even more interesting than that is the on the rock chart at number 11 is the hotshot debut of Come Together by Godsmack, which I think we've talked about that here before. Um, it's actually a fairly decent cover if you like that kind of music. Um, the by the way, the issue does have a big 50th anniversary, not a big, but uh, several 50th anniversary articles on the Grateful Dead, which is oh right because the, the 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 this is the the anniversary of their first album coming out right. this right. this past week. So, but anyway, uh, that uh, yeah, there's there, there's several articles in here. I haven't read through them yet, but um, there's and there's all sorts of ads too. But anyway, that's that's uh, that's the the big that's the chart news this week for the Beatles. I wonder if the uh, if the fact that Abbey Road is back on the chart has anything to do with uh, Gobsmack's uh, cover of Come Together. No, I can't. I can't, it, I, I it can't very, think of any any reason why Abbey Road would be back on the chart. It's been like one. It's been on there a lot. Um, it was it was there last week. It it dropped from uh, one fifty eight to one sixty nine. Hmm. So it, it and and one is like dark side of the moon it's there all right the time. that's just there yeah. all the time yeah um but i think but abbey road from my recollection stays in the charts quite a bit really huh how about hollywood bowl is that totally gone that's totally gone and also pure mccartney is not here so mm. and what about you had to bring that up huh? <laughs> <laughs> what about eight days a week Nothing else. No, no other Beatles albums are on here. And I'm sure in another, and probably in another month or so, I I would be willing to bet that Sergeant Pepper will make a, uh, a oh, reappearance. Oh, I, I, I would I would think that's probably a given. Probably more would, than a month. Mm-hmm. Probably people will wait for the whatever. Universal decides to give us, and right? Yeah, somebody, but I have a feeling. Some, I have a somebody, feeling even even the you know the original will uh, will probably will probably make a reappearance. On somebody the posted on Facebook today that uh, there's going to be something for Record Store Day. I would think, or that they've heard something about that. I would think that that. Would have been announced already if they were going to do something. Not necessarily, because the the announcement of what they're going to, you know, what package they're going to put out, uh, isn't going to come. At least from what I've heard, isn't going to come for about another week. And I would imagine if they announce, you know, whatever is going to be in the package. I imagine they'd probably announce any kind of record store day uh, uh, tie-in as well. At that hmm. point, but they haven't even called to ask us what they should do. No, no they haven't. This is, this is true. <laughs> the crumbs. <laughs> Although I've submitted to Beetle Fan my uh, my viewpoint. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
Okay. But um, the one thing I, I just wanted to bring up, and this has been going on for so many years, anytime there's any resurgence of interest in the Beatles when there's a new release, it usually tends to, you have the later Beatles albums make the charts. Right. It's always from Sgt. Pepper on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you'll see them somewhere in the top 200. So it doesn't surprise me that Abbey Road's there, but it wouldn't surprise me if the White Album you know, makes it back on the charts or Sgt. Pepper. But it's rare when it's anything pre-Sgt. Pepper. Hmm. Mm. You know? Interesting. Yeah. Okay, so moving on to Chuck Berry. That, I mean, he was 90 years old, and, you know, obviously that is a good old age. Um, right. But I have to say, I mean, when I heard about it on, on Saturday night, I was on my way to a concert and the and the reports began, you know, turning up on my iPhone. Um, mm. I really felt kind of, you know, I don't know if shocked is the word, but it was like, mm-hmm. it was like this was a disturbance in the force, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, Very much so. He was, uh, you know, I don't know if you can say he invented rock and roll. There were a lot of people contributing to the pot, so to speak, in those days. And, you know, Little Richard and Carl Perkins, all of those people who were the Beatles idols, you know, when they were just coming up. Um, but Chuck Berry has, like, really a special place, um, mm-hmm. you know, as a lyricist. You know, these these little sort of stories he had go in and they were, you know, they were sly and they were interesting and they were, you know, well-crafted little stories with, you know, messages in them uh, one way or another. But also, you know, I mean, some of them are really kind of funny if you listen to them. There's a, what was it? It's called the the 13 question method. Um, mm-hmm. It's it's not a, a, a real well known song, you know, but it's mm-hmm. you know it's sort of like the all the steps that you take when you go out with a girl and uh, you know uh, you're sort of doing your thing, and he he never gets up to number thirteen. I mean, he sort of tells you <laughs> one through twelve, and then that's the end of the song. And there's just a lot of stuff like that, and uh, you know, and not to mention, of course, the classic Chuck Berry riff, which turned up at the beginning of so many of his songs in different permutations, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, if you try to learn them, you, you, you know, there's sort of like a standard Chuck Berry riff people play, but if you want to learn them properly, you kind of got to look at each one because they all do something a little bit different, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> in, 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 in what way? Well, I mean, there, there, you know, there's, there's sort of a, a general sound, you know, da, 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 but, Mm-hmm. But then they go in different directions, and the notes are a bit different. And there's, mm-hmm. you know, he he introduces different rhythmic things in in some of them, and um, so it's not just you know it's not just sort of a boilerplate thing, and um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it really his music of the like 1955 to the early. 60s was really just the complete package. Um, mm-hmm. And you kind of have to wonder, you know, how his career would have been if he had spent maybe less time in jail. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I mean, those things, those man acts and, and tax evasion things, I mean, they, they sort of derailed his career. And, uh, you know, he came back and he continued playing. I mean, he played for a really long time people you could you could have different opinions about what all the playing meant i mean he would just sort of tour around get a local pickup band not really have much interaction with them because he sort of knew that they'd know his stuff sure right and Hmm. uh you know and he was also apparently a very difficult guy uh yeah uh, you know there was i don't know if any of the listeners remember the uh, q magazine years ago used to have a feature in every issue called who the hell does whoever it is they're talking to think he or she is and one of them was chuck berry and it was around the time that his autobiography and the taylor hackford film came out and he was Mm. in england to promote that but he had decided he would give all of his interviewers if he agreed to see them at all three minutes 
and mm. <laughs> and <laughs> you know and the, this story is all about you know I mean the 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 PR girl from Faber and Faber which which published the book refused to deal with him after the first encounter because he made a pass at her. And so she had intermediaries ferrying the journalists up. And it, I mean, it, it's just a really, it's a very obviously irreverent story, but mm-hmm. it gives a sense of, you know, how difficult he can be. Um, he always, he always insisted on being paid before he played in cash. Yeah. Yes. In cash, yeah. which you can kind of understand because you figure that a lot of fifties rock and roll people oh, got screwed. screwed. Oh yeah, they were screwed early on. Right. Mm-hmm. And, oh, yeah. And, uh, I mean that, that that doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah. But he was he was apparently more well known for that than anybody else was, which I, I which I kinda didn't understand, but that seemed to be his trademark. I, I mean, you you heard that story more about him than anybody else. I loved your point, though, Alan, about how his riffs were different. And I don't think that, uh, you know, that's not something mm. that really would, that given the way 50s rock and roll was, that's not something you would think about automatically. Mm-hmm. But it's But it really says a lot about him that he was you know that he was that um talented that he did that you know that he did that yeah. uh, that uh, i mean he was really the innovator that i mean he was i mean it, you know it goes without saying that he was an innovator and in fact it was funny l- listening to a, a radio interview locally here a CBS radio was doing an interview at uh, the local CBS station was talking to Ben Fong Torres and the woman goes, well, if he was a pioneer and Ben Fong Torres goes, he was a pioneer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how can you not, how can you not talk about him and right. say, if he was a pioneer? I mean, that was, that was crazy. That, that was said, crazy. that said his original band with Johnny Johnson on piano and, yes. you know, they are really a part of that early Chuck Berry sound too, mm. um, and they don't always get credit, you know. Um, mm-hmm. And they I should. Up the Johnny, I just picked up the Johnny Johnson album. I think it was last year, and it was wonderful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, solo, the solo album he did it was fantastic. In fact, uh, Johnny Johnson actually tried so because there are you know any number of contributions that he made to Chuck's hits that went totally uncredited. Right, and you know many years later he tried suing um, to get. You know royalties, and um, you know it was you know he had gone well past the what you might call the statute of limitations. Mm -hmm. You know it had been just too many years. Trying to remember, so he never he never got anything out of that. Nope, I think I think he might have gotten a little bit of like a token stipend. You know, from uh, from Chuck, but that was uh, and and actually, I think if I recall, uh, toward the end of his life, I think he even played with Chuck again for uh, for a certain amount of time. Mm-hmm. But no, he never really got the you know the financial uh, remuneration he was um, that he was supposed to get. You know, and uh, you know, John, uh, <laughs> John Lennon found out the uh, as as Keith Richard had had fa- found out the you know sort of the other side of uh, of Chuck Berry because apparently uh, when uh, when Chuck appeared on uh, uh, with uh, John and Yoko on the Mike Douglas show uh, backstage, apparently he was uh, quite difficult. Hmm. Mm-hmm. You know. Well, isn't there the story about how when they did Johnny Be Good, um, oh, yeah. they changed they changed the key yes. of the song in the middle and and didn't tell John they were going to do that right, and that kind of threw him off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he did that. And, he did that in the Taylor Hackford film with Keith Richards too. I mean, Keith, yeah. Keith had assembled this all star band um, and rehearsed the hell out of them. I mean, to the degree that he could get Chuck to rehearse and then in the concert Chuck started changing the keys and you, and you know. <laughs> one of his tricks I guess <laughs> I, yeah. I just found the uh, the billboard story about the dismissal of the uh, Johnny Johnson lawsuit and that's mm-hmm. exactly what the reason was it said ruling that too many years had passed yeah so no, that's too bad yeah, yeah. so and Chuck Chuck stole what from him exactly 
Uh, well, it, it, there were any number of um, contributions, basically, that that uh, the Johnny made to those, to, you know, um, in, uh, probably more instrumentally than uh, mm. than in terms of lyrics to you know any number of, of Chuck's hits. Right. And, he, he, did, he did the trademark piano on all those songs. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Exactly. And uh, and he just you know he never got never got any any composer credit on any of those songs. Whereas yeah. you, you would think um, Chuck would be sort of sympathetic to this, given that in Maybelline, when the record yeah. came out, he discovered that what was it, Alan Freed and Alan and, Freed and uh, someone else, two people had their names slapped onto the song yeah. and got royalties mm-hmm. that had nothing whatsoever to do with it. Yeah, hmm. yeah, exactly. Which of course was very common in those days. Yeah, right, yeah. right. But he managed to put an end to that, right? I mean, he. I think Maybelline might. Have, was that the only one, or did that continue for a while? Uh, oh, well, uh, of Chuck's hits, yeah, that was the only one. Yeah, that was the only, yeah yeah. After that, he uh, you know he pretty much, which is which is why Johnny Johnson didn't get uh, uh, didn't get any credit. Yeah, you know he apparently kept uh, uh, kept an eye on on who was getting the composer credits on you know all of his songs. Mm-hmm. It's interesting here. I'm looking at the story uh, as far as the the end of that lawsuit. The uh, attorney for uh, Chuck Berry blamed. Are you ready for this? Some of Johnny's advisors, including Keith Richards and Bo Diddley, for <laughs> pursuing yeah. <the> case. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, you were talking earlier about the guitar riffs, and I think that's a very important part of his legacy. Mm-hmm. Because how many other artists from the 50s can you name where the songs had an iconic introduction, mm-hmm. <laughs> like Johnny Be Good, and the songs were built around it? Right. And mm-hmm. the Beatles did quite a lot of that, too. You yeah. know, you know yeah. songs like Day Tripper or I Feel Fine. You know? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, well, that's he. He almost gave gave birth to the what you might you know the rock the rock guitar riff, mm-hmm. you know, to a great to a very great extent, and so yeah. the things like satisfaction and and uh, uh, and day tripper and paperback writer those those kinds of riffs are you know they were kind of birthed by what Chuck Berry was doing in in the fifties. Uh, but and another aspect too is uh, even before the Beach Boys did things like In My Room, he had the whole teenage experience in lyrics. And exactly, he did it. Yeah. He did it beautifully. Yeah, yeah really, the, the even only, though even though he was in his thirties when he did them. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. I mean, the, I mean, the only other people who were writing those kinds of songs in the fifties were Jerry Lever and Mike Stoller, and they weren't performers; they were, you know, songwriters and producers. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, Ch- uh, Chuck was really the only one. He was he was definitely, uh, I think I think it was Bruce Springsteen this weekend referred to him mm-hmm. as the uh, the poet the poet laureate of rock and roll. Mm-hmm. 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 And some of the some of those lyrics were pretty edgy for the, for the fifties. They yep. really were. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. So yeah. if you go back and actually look at the uh, look at the lyrics. And uh, but you can you know especially when you think about the you know the influence that um, you know on the Beatles mm-hmm. uh, you know they're probably you know uh, you know obviously you know obviously Elvis Presley was the you know he was the catalyst mm-hmm. that brought rock and roll to the masses because you know because he was young and he was sexy and he was white at a time when this country was so ridiculously segregated. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Andy was you know a very good vocal stylist, uh, but he was kind of the catalyst that brought rock and roll to the masses. Mm-hmm. And you know, and Buddy Holly a little bit later, uh, you know, was such a huge influence on the Beatles because of his uh, his his great ability in writing melodies and also the self contained the whole self contained aspect of mm-hmm. the you know of the of the crickets and with you know buddy writing the songs and uh you know their own you know their uh, their own arrangements yeah. uh and so that was very much an influence but but pr- probably more than anybody else 
probably Chuck Berry. Well, and was. of course, Buddy Holly also did a cover of Brown Eyed Handsome Man. Very which, true. Which the Beatles well, yeah. would have known. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, that, that, the idea that lyrics had to be good and mm-hmm. not just, you know, the simplest, most direct 50 esque love songs. Was um, Bebabalula. <laughs> well, you know, I think that, that, made a huge impression on the Beatles as songwriters when they were coming mm-hmm. out. Exactly. And, uh, well, speaking speaking of that very thing, I think you could probably put a direct link between She Was Just 17, You Know What I Mean, and Sweet Little 16. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Well, the important thing about I Saw Her Standing There was that Paul used the bass line from I'm Talking from, About from, You. From, Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's mm, it's very really similar. And admitted it. <laughs> yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, but there so. there are examples that the Beatles have said through the years, like uh, back in the USSR, oh, was yeah. a combination of back in the USA, yeah, which was a single around that time, sure, and also mixing that with a Beach Boy sound, right, mm-hmm. and not to mention the little matter of come together. Yep. Right. Sure. Right, for oh, which yeah. John was sued by, mm-hmm. by uh, yeah, by we've been Chuck's talking publisher. about lawsuits. We've been talking about lawsuits a lot on this show, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, in the in the in the Beatle world, unfortunately, lawsuits uh, have a very big part in, yeah. the, in the story. That you know, do. but but actually, even more directly. If you count the BBC recordings and the Star Club recordings and other and other things, the Beatles recorded, or there are there are Beatles performances of Chuck Berry songs, like more 15, than fifteen yeah, of them, I think they did more yeah. than you know more than anybody else that they covered. Yeah. Hmm. But you know, you were talking yeah. about come together there, Alan. Mm-hmm. But um, the the lawsuit really came from. Well, John lifting the line, you know, here come old flat top, which was right. similar to what Chuck Berry had said in the song, You Can't Catch Me. Okay. Yeah. Right. But if you if you listen to both those songs, mm-hmm. they're very similar of melodically. Course. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, you know really. what John said? I mean, I, 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 you hear this on the audio of the Rolling Stone interview, and I'm not sure whether the published versions ever restored it because it was originally cut out because John said, don't print that. But he's talking to Jan Wenner, and he says, yeah, of course I stole it. That's how I write songs. I have a song that that I like and that I'm thinking about, and I just sort of change the words bit by bit, and then I change the melody bit by bit, and come together mm-hmm. just sort of had the residue of... You know, you can't catch me in it. He he left too much in, you know, that he hadn't changed. And uh, but yeah, I mean that, that shows as well. We're talking about 1969, and John mm. is still thinking about you can't catch me while writing a new song for Abbey Road, you know, or for Timothy Leary or whatever he wrote it for originally, because um, mm-hmm. you know that was supposed to be a campaign song for Timothy Leary at one point. Oh, that's right. Um, yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it, it, and Chuck Berry was sort of always in their consciousness, I think. I mean, they, they jammed some of his stuff during the Let It Be sessions. And, you know, of course, the Mike Douglas appearance was well after the Beatles broke up. So, uh, and and John remained a fan. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah well, they all, they all love Chuck Berry. They yeah. love oh, yeah. all these 50s rock and roll artists. It's kind of hard to say who the most important was. But once you add in, you know, the guitar influence, the poetry of, of Chuck Berry's music, telling a story where it's not just, you know, uh, a typical love song mm-hmm. with its, uh, you know, and the words flowed so well, like poetry, I think that impressed the Beatles a lot. And um, sometimes when I, I listen to songs, like in the case of John, I kind of feel like New York City, mm-hmm. very mm-hmm. Chuck Berry-esque, just the sure. way the song, the, the the way the words flow, the way that they do, and there's a lot of words, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. in the song. And same thing with "Move Over, Mizell," oh, which yeah. um, when you hear that, it's "Move Over, Mizell." You know, I wish you well, and then mm-hmm. I think about um, you never can tell, <laughs> you know, yeah. where you, where you um, mixing the word "well" 
which yeah. the Beatles did a lot, you know. So, uh, yeah, I hear that in John. Run, Devil, Run was a song that Paul said was written in a Chuck Berry style. Mm-hmm. So it continued and, in the solo careers. And in fact, on that album, on Run, Devil, Run, he did, Paul did an excellent cover of Brown Eyed Handsome Man. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's a very different arrangement. Yeah, it is. It's, it's got like a Cajun feel to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it's it's great. <clears throat> Except he has the, the, the baseball details a little wrong. But he, he has a two, three, the count, nobody knows. Yeah, you know, well, you, so, know, yeah. you know, the, 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 these English people, they, uh, they don't know baseball. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. You know and, but, it, but, you know, it's not, and of course, it's, it, it wasn't just the Beatles who were, who were influenced by, uh, uh, by Chuck Berry. I mean, the Rolling Stones might not have existed without Chuck Berry. And then, and then after the Beatles broke up and the Stones had no one to really imitate, they went back yes. to Chuck Berry. <laughs> and they did, they basically did, you know, for the next uh, what forty five years or something, have done nothing but use you know basically take a Chuck Berry lick and build a song around mm-hmm. it. For, you know. It's basically you know, true. The, there is a talent to that. Sure. I mean, just think about "Come Together." We just talked about. Mm-hmm. It's very similar to "You Can't Catch Me," but the song is slowed down, mm-hmm. which, according to Paul, was his suggestion. And it's kind of disguised in such a way where it is its own song. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, and we must discuss, Ken, we must discuss Chuck Berry's only number one single. <laughs> <laughs> now that's sad. Uh, Which my was? Ding-a-ling. My Ding-a-ling. Right. Yeah, well, I've always liked the song. It's a novelty record, but when you compare it to what he did in the 50s, especially those classic songs... You know, it's a wonder that he had the chart performance that he did, considering the segregation, you know, and the fact that a lot Mm -hmm. of the white artists, the white artists who covered a lot of what black artists were doing, the people like Pat Boone, you know, they were getting a lot of airplay, you know, Mm -hmm. at the time. So, but he still did fairly well on the charts. Did, yeah, he did fairly well, and and fortunately, he was able to, unlike Little Richard and and Fats Domino, Chuck was able to escape uh, having those those horrible white covers of his songs because I think I think the the you know the white artists, the Pat Boone's and Teresa Brewers of the world, you know, probably didn't know what to make of yeah. his of his songs yeah so i mean the, they, the, the lyrics were just too sly for the for that for yeah for the, that kind of cover you know <laughs> what would you do with it i mean you'd, you'd have to change them and you don't want to do that i mean yeah mm-hmm. uh, yeah you guys were talking about i mean we all know that he did you know his probably his best work in the 50s but i mean he released that uh, album in 64 in called st louis to liverpool Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which was, and that had two really good Chuck Berry songs on it. it had no particular place to go. Right. And it also had mm. "You Never Can Tell," which yeah. are you know, they're both really, really good songs. Um, I just wanted to say to people, if you, you know, if it turns out you don't have any Chuck Berry in your collection, the place to start is the Great Twenty Eight. Yes. Oh yeah, Absolutely. that's great. That yeah. is the place to start. Uh, that's you'd have the. That's the one of. Uh, but I can <laughs> save you. I can save you some money. You're going to listen to the mm. Great Twenty Eight. You're going to love everything on it, and you're going to say, "Well, I really should get more stuff." So you could save money on the Great Twenty Eight and just get the um, the Bear uh, any, Family. The, the Bear, Bear Family, family <laughs> any old way you choose it. Which is what was that like? Uh, Three hundred dollars. Well, it's sixteen discs, though. I mean, and it's right. got, and it's got like pretty much everything uh right. you know way up to the 70s live stuff and mm-hmm. uh you know and you can it gives you the opportunity all on the same set to see how sad it is that my dingling was his one number one hit when there's mm-hmm. all this other stuff you know? right so right yeah i would just i would just skip right to rock and roll <laughs> music any old way you choose it on bear family 16 discs um can't go wrong. <laughs> I was you know, surprised. I was surprised. I looked up on Amazon today. Apparently, Hell Hell Rock and Roll the movie is out of print. Really? It is the, really the prices. The prices. Well, the used prices are way up. That might have something to do with you know his mm. passing. But 
Apparently. I have a feeling that it might, uh, especially now, it may uh, end up. Uh, coming, coming up back. on you know on uh, on a, you know Amazon or you know one of the uh, streaming services Netflix. Well, maybe or maybe it'll get Hulu. maybe it'll get reissued. I mean that that would be it's about time. I mean, I mean they already had put it out as like a deluxe edition with mm-hmm. the director's cut kind of thing, extra stuff. Right. Um, Which really, I mean, that isn't really. Uh, it's okay if you're a you know a real historic. You know, but if for uh, for people who just want to see the movie, you want to get that the single disc, and and that isn't even available right now. So yeah, that's a great film. Um, you know, and it and it, you know, to get back to the thing we were saying about how difficult it can be, it, it shows right in the film. You know, uh, yeah, there's this there's this one rehearsal sequence where Keith Richards, who is Let's admit, you know, the supreme Chuck Berry interpreter mm-hmm. in, in the world, certainly now, but even in, in a way while Chuck was alive. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. he he knew that stuff inside out, and he and, there, and Chuck Berry keeps stopping him and saying, now, come on, do it right. If you're going to do it, mm-hmm. do it right. And at one point, he just sort of turns away from Chuck and looks at the camera and rolls his eyes, and you can, <laughs> you can <laughs> see the frustration. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but you know, and then in the end, he says, "You know what? But you can't help but like the guy." You know, I mean, this is his hero, and uh, oh yeah, you know, right. and you're fact, willing over the to weekend. put up with a lot. <laughs> yeah, over the weekend, in fact, Mick and uh, and the Stones as a group released some very nice uh, tweets uh, in in Chuck's honor. Paul mm-hmm. McCartney issued a statement today. Um, yeah, what a, did very a very long statement. Do you do you want me to uh, read part of this? Sure. Not? Um, it said, from the first minute we heard the great guitar intro to Sweet Little Sixteen, we became fans of the great Chuck Berry. His stories were more like poems than lyrics, the likes of Johnny Be Good or Maybelline. To us, he was a magician making music that was exotic yet normal at the same time. We learned so many things from him, which led us into a dream world of rock and roll music. Chuck was and is forever more of forevermore. One of rock and roll's greatest legends of all times. I was privileged to meet him in his hometown, St. Louis, when I played there on tour. And it's a memory I will cherish forever. It's not really possible to sum up what he meant to all us young guys growing up in Liverpool. But I can give it a try. Long live rock and roll. Love you, Chuck. Paul. Mm. Very nice. nice. Mm-hmm. And Ringo, Ringo had something too, right, Steve? Ringo, yeah. yeah. Ringo, uh, let me let me switch. Uh, <laughs> Ringo put up two tweets the day he passed. Said R.I.P. and peace and love, Chuck Berry, Mr. Rock and Roll Music. And he and then he put up a second one that said, "Just let me hear some of that rock and roll music." And he oh, will you choose it? I am playing. I'm talking about you. God bless Chuck Berry, Chuck. Mm. So. Mm. Oh, and and while we're recommending uh, things that uh, to be able to get an idea of of, of Chuck's impact, both uh, you know musically and visually, mm-hmm. um, you uh, Steve, you just uh, recently had gotten the uh, the the reissue of the Tammy Show. Yeah. The, oh, yeah. The Tammy which, Show. And there's a, a major segment in there. Right, the That's Tammy right. show. Uh, the Tammy show uh, came out on Blu-ray, and actually, if you buy the Blu-ray, it comes in a package with the Tammy show and the TNT show. And they also, at the same time, released the TNT show on DVD, which was not out before. But the Chuck Berry segment is great. It's a, mm-hmm. a long segment. It ha- I can't remember how many songs. I think it's like six songs, and it interacts. It it he with, it, he with inter- Jerry and the pacemakers. Jerry, right? Jerry and the pacemakers, and in fact, when Chuck does Maybelline. Jerry takes over and and does mm-hmm. his version of Maybelline. So um, it's I mean it's a and, and Chuck duck duck walks across the stage. It's a term, It's one of the best segments in that film. And yeah. so there's another thing to look for. I should also mention mention and um, there's been more and more news coming out on it today that Chuck's got an album that he was working yes. on yep. at, yeah. at the time of his death, and they haven't. They have not said when it's coming out, but they, but they're starting to hype it. Uh, it was today. originally scheduled for June, right? Before, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, looking on, I'm looking on the story I printed out from Billboard today, and it doesn't say uh, doesn't say exactly when it's going to come out. Uh, it's going to be on Dual Tone Records, 
and his family said um, today that working to prepare the release of this record in recent months, and in fact over the last several years, brought Chuck a great sense of joy and satisfaction. So, mm. but yeah, they are starting to hype it, and we should actually be hearing by the time the show comes out. We probably will be hearing more apparently uh, on that. And in fact, another uh, rocker that is doing a, an album or that has got an album coming out is uh, Dion. And I, I hate I, to, I yes. hate, to, I, I, I was gonna, I was gonna mention that that I interviewed Dion last week. Yeah. And, and that was an interesting experience. There's, no, there's nothing Beatles about it. We didn't talk, we didn't discuss really discuss the Beatles at all. But uh, it's it's it, it, there are Dylan songs on there, and it's a great. It's really a good album. It's really well done. So um, back to Chuck, gotta, there, there was uh, there were a handful of sort of film features that he did as well in in the oh 50s. yes um, go oh, jo- God, go Johnny yes. go where he had speaking roles and you know and played um, and those are worth getting their hands on too I can't remember the titles of the others uh, well the, the, the one that was the, in the one that's rock, really really yeah the, he's rock he rock rock. Bit, Rock, he's rock, in a rock, bunch rock. of old ones, and some of those are are in public domain, and they're very cheap if yeah. you look around. But the one that's not on DVD, unfortunately, is American Hot Wax with Tim oh, Mack. Right. Yeah, which is I love that movie. Yeah, you didn't, you didn't, I mean that's such a great movie. And Go and Johnny was Go funny. is fun too. Yeah, yeah, it is, but it, it was fun because I was just watching the clip from American Hot Wax yesterday, huh. and um, it, actually, it's at the end, right after Jerry Lee Lewis, who's also in the movie, does this really crazy ending to tr- because he's forced to go on before Chuck, and he mm-hmm. burns the piano and he kicks it and everything, and right, it's a hell of a show, and and Chuck comes out, and then he finds, and then they come over and tell. Uh, Tim McIntyre is Alan Freed that the IRS has put a lien on the box office receipts and he's not going to be able to pay anybody. And which is really ironic because of what we said earlier about. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And Chuck goes, well, rock and roll has done a lot for me. I'm going to do a lot for rock and roll. I'm going to go out and play. And he does. And he go, yeah. and he, play, and he plays a great two song set. I I think he does Sweet Little 16 as one of the songs. But it's very ironic after what we said earlier about him not being paid that he does that in the movie. And unfortunately, like I said, that movie is not available legally on DVD, which really stinks. Yeah. It's one of the best movies. Jay Leno is in it. Right, a very young Jay Leno, uh, Lorraine <laughs> Newman. The rain. Um, the, the girl, the uh, the the girl who did the nanny, whose name right. I forget. Fran Drescher. Fran yes. Drescher is in it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a fantastic movie, and and the only thing I can obviously it's a rights thing, music rights thing from somebody. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, but the fact that, for example, that American Graffiti is out there with Chuck's music in it, he's not in mm. it. But music is in it, and actually, American Graffiti. I I know I'm I'm knowing all this because I I have a story that I'm going to put up tonight. But one of the best scenes in American Graffiti is the scene. With uh, sweet little sixteen, when yes. the girls when the girls throw the water balloon at Paul mm-hmm. Lamont, and yep. Mackenzie Phillips, and they get out and they tort- <laughs> and they take the car, and they put soap all over the car. I mean, that's one of the uh, to the tune of sweet little sixteen. I mean, that's a great scene. Yeah, it's one of the best scenes in the movie, and and you know, and uh, it's boy, it's just. It, I mean, that just the whole spirit of of Chuck's music is there. You know, so. Mm-hmm. You know, Chuck, like a lot of artists, benefited a lot from, you know, artists like the Beatles covering his music and other British invasion artists, too, but also his music being in films. Because right. you were just talking about American Graffiti there, and uh, I can't. I always think of Pulp Fiction because okay. of uh, the use yeah. of You Never Can Tell, which is right. one of my favorite songs from him. Mm-hmm. So, and it was, it was used so perfectly in that film. Did you guys ever see him? I guys- saw him no. twice. Twice. Twice I saw him once. I saw him once, and it was it was at the uh, Paul Masson Winery here in Saratoga, where Ringo has played, as a matter of fact. And um, 
yeah, it was uh, it was a, I think it was a day show, uh, and he played. He he was a, it was a he, it was a pickup band. I I don't remember who the band was. It was some uh, unknown local band that he used here, and and uh, of course they knew everything he he did, and it was a it was a good show. But uh, it was interesting. He was hanging out with a girl between you know before before he went on he was he was standing up against a tree you could have walked over and said something to him i did not but he was just standing there and it was it was uh it was funny huh. mm-hmm. oh. mm. yeah and if anybody is uh, if anybody's keeping score now of who's left among the you know what the you older. might call the the founding fathers of rock and roll basically we are now down to fats domino little mm-hmm. richard Jerry Lee Lewis and Don Everly, and Pat Pat Boone. If you want to, well, Pat not Boone. Pat Boone. No. <laughs> the man rocks, Al. Oh yes. please, <laughs> Paul Anka. Paul Anka's yeah. still around. There's well, still a, lot of, a lot of singers that are not necessarily rockers. Yeah, but, you know, the, no, but they Johnny weren't. Mathis, Johnny Mathis, people like that. Right, but no, but yeah. they were they weren't the architects of rock and roll like these right. guys were. Right. You know, so right. that's that's it. That's I mean, you know, it makes sense because it's 60 years later, but uh but that's uh, that's all that's left. Yep. Mhm. Hmm. Mm-hmm. I've always been aware of those few people left and just you know, last year we talked about all the major deaths and there were so many of them and I mm-hmm. kept thinking, but you know, we still have Fats Domino. Yeah. <laughs> Even though he's been inactive for years. Well, yeah, so you know. is little Richard hasn't been. Playing. Richard is retired now. Yeah, yeah. Je- Jerry Lee still does a few shows here and there, right? Mm-hmm. But he's he's not, and yeah, he's, he's not anywhere he's not near enough. the way he used to be. I, oh, no. I, no, I, I don't. Have I told this story to you guys? I have, there's a great story. I have a great story about Jerry mm-hmm. Lee Lewis. I saw him uh, several years ago in San Jose, and. Uh, my fr- my friend was reviewing the show, and he invited us. We got he, a whole bunch of us got to go, and we had front row seats. And I was sitting dead spot in the middle, front row. So I was really close to him. And he played. He put on a you know he put on his, his usual show, but it was clear through the whole night that he did not like the piano. He hated the piano. You could mm-hmm. he was pointing to it. He was grumbling about it. We could hear him talking about it to Kenny Lovelace, who was his uh, lead guitarist. Comes the last song. He had a bottle of whiskey next to him. The mm-hmm. whole song. He picks up the bottle of whiskey and starts and grabs it oh, by no. the back, and <laughs> he starts to swing the bottle towards the keys. Oh God! Who, who is seeing? seeing uh, who is sitting? Directly where Black. Has- <laughs> oh no! Yes, it was me. And I'm oh. looking, and I'm going, "Oh my God, is he really going to do that?" And he starts to swing, and he stops. And there's this big relief in my, you know, I go, oh, thank God he did do that." <laughs> because one of the people, one of the people with us, is a writer who had profiled him for Rolling Stone, oh. and. And and uh, he knew Chuck was crazy. Um, Jerry Lee. All right, I'm sorry, Jerry Lee. He knew, he knew Jerry yeah. Lee was crazy. And uh, in fact, there's a, another story that I can't even say on the air uh, about uh, what he had asked him about the night that he, they caught him on Graceland with the gun in his hand. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So anyway, that's it. but yeah. Jerry Jerry Lee was fantastic. I I have very many great memories and I did get to shake the band's hand that night so but mm. I, I Jerry Lee's music has always been had a special place in my heart as does Chuck Berry's so mm-hmm. there we go peace and uh-huh. love peace and love, <laughs> peace and love. <laughs> of all the um, covers that the Beatles did and solo of Chuck Berry would anyone like to say what their favorite is if they have one hmm that's interesting. Um, uh, uh, if I could throw a curveball, it would be actually the Washington Coliseum performance of Roll Over Beethoven, which was the first song uh-huh. they ever played in concert in America. Mm. You know, right. I, obviously not counting the Ed Sullivan show. 
which is it, but it's you know obviously that show is legendary because of how just how great they were. You know, as a you know, they they were very especially Ringo. Uh, Ringo was on fire that night, right? And um, you know, then they and this that was probably as probably as good as close as we ever got to seeing the you know as they called them the savage young Beatles. Mm-hmm. But it started with a especially good, despite the sound problems. Oh yeah, especially good performance of uh, of Rollover Beethoven. Yeah, I don't think I can I can be I can best that out. That was a good that was a good one. That, yeah. that George was, George had to keep moving around. Yeah, mm-hmm. to, to mm-hmm. different to a different mic. You know, right. I kind of like their BBC performances of Too Much Monkey Business. Um, yeah, Lennon singing. Um, I'm um, talking about you is pretty talking good about too. You. Mm-hmm. Uh, gotta find my baby. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, gotta find my baby is really pretty good. Yeah, I remember when you know back in the bootleg days when these things were you know just sort of turning up one by one. I mean they were all sort of revelatory, you know, as they right as they uh, happen and. You know, I mean, it's it's interesting because they do them really very differently than than Chuck Berry did himself. And um, mm-hmm. you know, I remember at one point just sort of sitting down with you know, well, the Great Twenty Eight, <laughs> because yeah. the bear the bear set wasn't out yet, you know, um, <laughs> right? So, uh, and just listening, you know, track by track to the things that the Beatles had covered, and and a lot of cases i i kind of like chuck berry's originals better there was a kind of spareness about them but you know i wouldn't want to have to choose between them really you know the beatles ones are you know they're beatly and mm-hmm. they they put their stamp on everything they did but there really is something magical about the originals of all these songs oh sure mm-hmm. i agree it's 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 weird i remember Picking up that, uh, you remember the bootleg "Too Much Monkey Business" that mm-hmm. came, that came out. You talking about revelatory? For some reason, I attach that more to Buddy Holly than to Chuck Berry. I don't know why, hmm. but I don't know. But uh, I, no, I agree with Al though that roll over Beethoven. Yeah, uh, that was a spectacular perform. Another another Chuck Berry cover, not by the Beatles, by the way that that stands out was uh the faces doing memphis uh that was uh, another I, mm-hmm. I i mean you could probably talk about uh chuck berry covers you know especially oh, the hey, rolling uh, the, stones the um rolling in, stones. in yeah. fact uh, knowing knowing how you feel about levon levon helm uh steve the band's cover of promised land on mm-hmm. Ma- on moondog matinee is mm-hmm. fabulous mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah i love levon i love levon helm Love, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, when it comes to when it comes to Beatles, I really love the BBC performance of Sweet Little Sixteen. Mm-hmm. I yeah. think that that performance just smokes, and uh, the mm-hmm. lead guitar work from George is just fantastic in that song. And it's hard to top rock and roll music; just their recording of that. Yeah. And mm-hmm. uh, I also like John's version of Sweet Little Sixteen on rock and roll. I know that there were certain songs where he slowed him down, but yeah. I didn't it at all. But I do like that version very much mm-hmm. on rock and roll. And I also like when Paul did Sweet Little Sixteen, which was part of the, the Backyard Tapes, mm-hmm. when he just played it on acoustic guitar, just that, just him and an acoustic and nothing else. Mm. And, uh, yeah, Brad Out Handsome Man from Paul is also a real good one, too. Yep. So. Mm-hmm. And I and think I mean, uh, also there's... Um, uh, there's a version um, because uh, George didn't really do that many Chuck Berry covers in, in a solo career, but he did do a live performance. And unfortunately, the song is in one of the actually one of the last uh, live appearances he made. I think this was after the. It may have been after the Japan tour, and unfortunately, it was a benefit show. And unfortunately, it's been wiped from my. Uh, <laughs> It Increasingly, he, which one did he perform? With? Didn't he do Johnny Be Good? Yeah, that's with, another thing. Um, with uh, John it's, Fogarty, maybe in a club, in a small club. Oh, that may have been the Palomino Club. The yeah, Palomino. no, I think this was no. I think the one I'm thinking of is from a uh, is from a benefit, not not one of the not the Prince's Trust, but another benefit uh, show. 
and unfortunately, it's uh, not coming to mind. You talking about you talking about rollover Beethoven with uh, George? It may have been. It may be rollover Beethoven. Because or... I'm looking, I'm looking at a Wikipedia list, and I don't the, that I don't necessarily trust, but and it's showing George covering rollover Beethoven, and I'm I don't off the top of my head, I don't remember it. Well, he did roll over Beethoven in Japan. Well, yeah, yeah, that's true. Okay, there we go. Yeah, there uh, we go. but yeah, but I think there was another performance of another Chuck Berry song that was in a, a benefit performance that he gave sometime, and I think in the, either the late '80s or very early '90s, and it's just not coming to mind. Okay, we're coming to the end of our hour, and uh, it's yeah, it's been sort of great reminiscing about Chuck Berry and. Um, uh, I think we'll probably all be doing that for for some time to come. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if you guys listen to the, to his music regularly. I, I put it on pretty often, actually. Um, it turns out, but I think I'd like to go through that Bear Family set start to finish and listen to every track uh, in the next couple of weeks. So I think just just by osmosis, I think those of especially those of us who who kind of gravitate to what you might call classic rock we end up hearing covers yeah of of his work more than anything else probably mm-hmm. and, there, yeah. and there's a and there's a million of those out there that's right mm. that's right yeah sometimes there's nothing better than going back to the originals absolutely oh sure absolutely and the bear family set really does sound good too i mean those are very good transfers and that Bear Family takes care with their productions. So, mm-hmm. right. Um, anyway, the Jerry Lee Lewis set is fantastic. That's true too. What is that one? Like eighteen discs, something like that. Something like that. Yeah. 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 They do good work. So anyway, by the way, you know, <laughs> by the way, you know, you just mentioned Jerry Lee Lewis. I just remembered he made the album Last Man Standing, and Ringo That's was true. on there. Yes. That's right. And and they did Sweet Little Sixteen together right. on there. Mm-hmm. Yes, yep. that's right. Mm-hmm. Which I think is the only Chuck Berry cover that Ringo has done in his post Beatles career. Hmm. You're right. Yeah. Okay, so um, that's that's it for this week. And thank you for listening. And will uh, Ken? How do people get in touch with you? Uh, through my email address, which is every little thing at att dot net. Also visit my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com. And I should just very briefly mention, since I occasionally have special contests, I will have one coming pretty soon, and it involves a major release that I think we all know about. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. It should start, it should start this Friday, I think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When it's hot off the press. That's right. Mm-hmm. Sizzling. Sizzling. Okay. Um, and Steve, how do people get in touch with you? Uh, BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com. I have a page on Facebook and a news group, Beatles uh, News and Commentary. Okay. And Al? Uh, real simple. Uh, Facebook, Al Sussman. Uh, Twitter, at ASUSS49. Uh, or through this, the, the show uh, the show page on Facebook or through uh, Beetle Fan Magazine, www.beetlefan.com. Okay, and the show page that Al mentioned is Things We Said Today, Beatles Radio Fans. Right. You mm-hmm. can also email us at Things We Said Today, Radio Show at gmail.com and follow us on Twitter at the at sign and Things We Said Fab. And you can reach me at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed on Facebook and follow me on Twitter at, at Cozen. So for all of my uh, colleagues here, um, I'm Alan Cozen saying see you next week and thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.